welcome everyone. It's nice for you to come out on this first snowy event of the year. <laughs> Brave souls. Um, I'm Dr. Bove, and I've been on the staff at the, this is my 27th year on staff at the Rutland Regional Medical Center. And uh, I'm here to talk about stress incontinence and other types of incontinence tonight. Um, of all the areas in neurology, we deal with a lot of areas. We deal with kidney stones, we deal with men's prostates, we deal with erectile dysfunction, we deal with cancers, um, and uh, this is one of my favorite areas because I, I actually like treating this condition because you actually can do something for somebody. You know, it's, it's not a you know, life-threatening condition, but it really, you know, I, I learned a long time ago, uh, incontinence is almost like a social cancer because the effects of incontinence begin to affect your daily lifestyle. You know, you, you begin to become embarrassed. You can't go out and, and you don't even want to leave the home. Uh, and it's really devastating to people sort of mentally and uh, it affects them socially. They just retract from the world. But if you can rectify those situations that cause incontinence, and sometimes we can do some good for people, um, it's, it's very satisfying to treat patients who have stress incontinence. Okay, whoops. Okay, I guess this, these are, this, is, this is who I am. Uh, um, it's actually 145 Allen Street. That's where I practice, right across the street here from the hospital. Um, and this is where I've gone in my lifetime. I've uh, graduated from the University of Vermont College of Medicine, 1981. Um, I did two years of general surgery um, at Mount Sinai Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio, where my first two children were born. And then I moved across the street. I, mo I moved across the street to the University Hospitals Case Western Reserve. And I have affiliations with uh, Rutland Regional Medical Center, and I was on Porter Medical S uh, Center um, staff for a long time. So, okay, what we're going to try to do is we're going to talk uh, the types of uh, what we'd like to home home tonight. The types of uh, common types of bladder leakage we see. Um, we. Um, uh, we're going to deal with the big one is stress incontinence. So we'll try to give you a definition for what that is and, 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 and what the options for. Uh, we will briefly touch on uh, pelvic organ prolapse. Um, I won't dwell on that so much, but I certainly will ask, you know, you can ask me a lot of questions regarding that condition. So bladder leakage. I was going to start off with a definition. Um, bladder leakage uh, is known as incontinence. It's sort of the loss of bladder control, involuntary loss of urine. You stand up and you're wet. You turn on the, uh, uh, the faucet, you're wet. Why does this happen? Well, why does it come about? Um, so, but it's a sort of a big problem. Uh, one in three adult women have it. Uh, um, it's so it's very prevalent in the society. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things that we just don't talk about. Um, um, <laughs> even in this day of social media, nobody, you know, this is, this is sort of taboo. We just don't talk about um, this, and even with their friends. And they, and, and they don't talk about it with their friends. They won't even talk about it with their health care providers because it's a very embarrassing. Um, uh, and, People are embarrassed, they feel ashamed, they're unaware their condition might be treatable. They think their symptoms are due to aging. They are, there's a lot of, aging brings on a lot of problems and uh, um, so we'll go into those. So when we, when we talk about incontinence, we, we try to categorize these as best we can. And <clears throat> urgency incontinence uh, is really the strong sudden need to urinate due to a bladder spasm or contraction. The bladder is a muscle and it contracts. You don't have any, sometimes you have some control over it and sometimes you don't. Um, normally, um, um, when you're, you're young, um, when a baby, the baby urinates 20, and, you know, 20 times a day, the bladder fills and it 
squeezes. And I had my, 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 I had my I'm a proud grandfather, and I was visiting my grandson for the first time last weekend, seven days old, and that's all he did, all weekend long. <laughs> <laughs> and, and basically, it's, uh, so we'll get into that, but it's, it's just a sudden need, need to urinate, and uh, uh, you can't, you, sometimes you can't control that. Whereas stress incontinence is really that involuntary loss of urine that occurs during physical activity, such as coughing, sne sneezing, laughing, exercise, um, picking up something heavy may cause you to um, leak your urine. Um, up in the urgency continence category, it's uh, people will uh, get a bladder contraction just from changing positions, from sitting to standing. Ah, I got up, I got wet. Why is that? And then um, there is mixed incontinence, which is a combination of both these conditions. And um, it, it sometimes it's very tough in the treatment of these conditions. That, you know, um, the most in general, the stress incontinence is mostly treated by you know, interventions, whereas the urgency incontinence is really no good surgery for that or procedure. That's mostly medical or behavioral. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So, um, uh, and this is sort of the uh, space you can see that urgency incontinence is, is, is not terribly con um, common as a pure isolated entity, but the stress incontinence, uh, I mean, these are people who have uh, diabetes, who've had children, who have some other medical conditions, um, and it's much more prevalent in the population. And then we have this, uh, the mixed people who have both the urgent and the stress incontinence. <clears throat> so basically, when we talk about urgent incontinence, it's really, you know, described as by the patients as needing to go, even if they had just went, you know, it just, they, they can't, they turn on the faucet and then they leak. Um, they change positions, they leak. Um, they see water running, they leak. Um, and the options really include, um, as I briefly, mostly, predominantly, is medication. Um, we can definitely make some dietary changes. Um, if you're drinking four cups of coffee a day or three cups of tea, well, that, those things are irritants. So, when we when we deal with in, when, when we deal with uh, um, incontinence, at least the urgency incontinence, one of the first thing we do is, you know, what are you taking in your diet? Are you are you, are you taking? I have a list of bladder irritants, things that will cause you to go to the bathroom uh, and and really squeeze your bladder. Uh, these include cough, caffeinated products, alcohol, um, citrus juices, the big um, one. Um, chocolates will make you do it. These are, these, are, these are things that are easy to treat, but you just have to take the history. Um, there's bladder retraining, and there's Kegel exercises, there's biofeedback, electrical stimulations, and I can go into that. Um, we're finding more and more with, uh, you know, there's a lot of medications out there, and these don't always work, and we're starting to revert now to, uh, like, biofeedback and uh, electrical stimulation where you're almost retraining things, your muscles. And then there is surgery, but it's very uncommon. We, we rarely do that. So some, um, in, in the urgency incontinence, uh, is treated by primary care and internal medicine physicians. They, they, they make a stab at it. Um, and sometimes uh, um, they're good at it, and some, some, don't prefer, some prefer not to treat, and some feel uncomfortable with it. So your primary care provider uh, really depends. Uh, most often those that are not comfortable with treating these conditions will refer it on to specialists like myself, a urologist, who deals with this. So uh, we talked about uh, mixed incontinence. It's a combination of both the urge and the stress. And it's often treated, um, um, usually we like to treat the stress in common. Uh, we try to, from our history taking in the office, we try to determine when, when does the leakage occur? Is it mostly when I, I'm lifting or coughing or sneezing, or is it just when I, I'm unaware of it, you know, just when I've just changed positions? So we try to balance that out. And normally, what we usually try to do is we, you know, we'll, we'll treat the stress incontinence first. And a lot of times, in mixed situations, um, the urgency will get better. 
um, but not always. So when we're pure, purely dealing with stress incontinence, again, this is the, the this is the uh, loss of urine. Oops, I'm sorry, this is the loss of urine um, with coughing, sneezing, um, and or any body any body movement which puts pressure on your bladder. Um, <clears throat> These risk factors, uh, people um, who age, um, who pregnancy, as really, um, you know, because what happens is when you, your muscles, your pelvic floor muscles are weak. These are, this is a, a, a set of muscles that are on the floor and there are three things that go through those, that floor. So there's three tubes. Those three tubes are one is your, your urinary channel called your urethra. The second channel is your, um, the birth canal, the, vagi the, the vagina, and the, uh, fourth th the third thing is the rectum. So with prolonged labor, uh, pregnancies, vaginal de deliveries, these um, uh, will be stretched and they will be permanently stretched out because we rely on these, a woman relies on these muscles to tighten. Whether they know it or not, they, they use these muscles, they, they, they will tighten when you bend over, when you squeeze. These, these, these muscles are automatically tight, will tighten for you. Um, and, you know, part of the therapy sometimes is to try to strengthen those muscles. And you can do that with biofeedback training, you can do it with exercises. Um, but those muscles are very, very important. And as you age, sometimes those muscles are just, you know, we lose muscle mass. And that's one of the reasons why aging affects um, incontinence is because that muscle mass shrinks and, and, and they don't grab as tightly as they should. So uh, obesity um, with all the pressure on the, on the pelvic floor, um, a hysterectomy um, can, can cause one to have, um, can affect those muscles as well. Um, <clears throat> So um, these physical activities, what you're doing, uh, you know, if you're really stressing those muscles, the gymnastics, you know, I don't know how many people are doing gymnastics at age 50, but I mean, so activities like that, you know, um, the, pop, the generation now is they're much more active than our parents were and many more women are at the gyms and doing body pump and all these exercises that are really uh, create a lot of strain. And, uh, uh, the, uh, the incontinence becomes more pronounced. Um, uh, smoking is never good for anybody. Uh, family history, diet, we talked about that. And then you know, certain medical conditions cause like diabetes and uh, um, uh, neurological conditions like multiple sclerosis uh, can have an effect, Parkinson's disease. Uh, they can contribute to the condition. <clears throat> so basically some of these uh, treatments for stress incontinence include, you know, pelvic floor muscle training because remember it's it's the it's the muscles that we want to tighten in, and we call these we we call these exercises Kegel exercises. And I'm sure, you know, the, after you had the birth of your babies, uh, you know, doctors gave you well your 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 pelvic floor has been stretched out, but if you do these exercises called Kegels, you'll get this back. You know, you can retighten, you can retrain those muscles. Um, to, to strengthen again, um, and basically it's like weightlifting for your pelvic floor. These are the this is the muscle that you use with if you have to urinate and you're not in a spot that you can get to a toilet in time, you will automatically tighten your muscles, which I'm doing right now, and keep them squeezed. And those are the those are the pelvic floor muscles. And you know, it, and there's a, the, the same set of muscles work on the rectal area too because if, you, if you're in a, a situation and you, you feel bloated or gassy and you, you're in a crowd, we'll sometimes use the, the pelvic floor muscles for the rectum. But you can differentiate between those, those muscles that go around your, your rectal area and those that go around your urethra. Um, and so basically, um, this is really a very successful treatment, a, a non-medical, a non-surgical treatment is uh, to do pelvic floor. But the truth is, when you're, <clears throat> they may work great when you're 40, but uh, I'm not sure how often do you want to do these when you're 80. So it's, it's, you know, it's kind of like you, you know, a weightlifter. You know, does he want to go to the gym every day when he's 80 
as a, when he was 40, he was in the gym all the time. It's just not so easy. You just don't have the energy to do these. So um, the other thing we like to try to do is to, for sometimes it helps to do prompted voiding. That's where you start to look at your watch and there, um, you go every couple hours and that, that, that empties your bladder more completely so that you don't leak um, <clears throat> as much or the volume is much less. That's, that's uh, we call time voiding. And um, there's really no medications at this point that's really indicated. There are medications that were used, but they're not, you know, they're not approved by the FDA. We call them off-label. Um, and there are certain med medications that we'll use to try to uh, tighten, uh, tighten things up. But that's only in rare situations where we, we might use a medic, where I might use a medication. Um, there are surgical treatments, um, and these basically um, what they do is when you bend over and cough, normally I said these muscles tighten. So when you bend over, everything moves on you. We need, we can't, we don't have an operation that re, you know, re, uh, re tightens the muscle or re brings it back to its original position. So we have to devise a procedure where, okay, if we can't, you know, if we can't tighten that muscle, we then we need to try to keep the bladder in its original position because if it stays, which is just behind your pubic bone, and if you can keep it there and it doesn't move when you move, then you might be able to uh, stay dry. And so the purpose of all these, um, these, these treatments is to keep the bladder in a sort of fixed position so it doesn't move when you bend over, when you, when you exert pressure uh, on your abdomen and bear down. So that's what the, the nature of these procedures do. Um, in the old days, we used to do open surgery. Now, most of our procedures are very minimally invasive. Uh, we use slings, meshes, and we'll talk about that in just a second. And they have gotten some bad press recently, and I'll try to differentiate the types of uh, uh, the, the things that have come under fire by the FDA. So, so basically, um, <clears throat> sort of what I said here, uh, do we have a pointer at all, Sue? Uh, on your, uh, the red button on your uh, Oh, there it is. Okay, very good. <laughs> so basically, um, the, you, know, the, 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 you know, the bladder's job is to store urine, so just to sort of back, sidetrack a little bit. The reason why we don't urinate like a, an infant is because um, our brain um, develops in its, the brain signals to the bladder are mostly what we call ones of inhibition, okay? And we need to store urine because we can't go every hour. And that's what, as we develop, our, our, our brain develops and uh, we get older, we develop, we're able to suppress that reflex because of messages that are sent from our brain down to the bladder. Um, and um, so that's how we store in the bladder has um, a very nice elasticity. It, it's got uh, fibers in it that are very elastic. Even though it's a muscle, it can stretch. So the, its major functions is to store urine and then to empty it. So the sphincter muscle, which is these four, and I don't have a good picture, but it wraps all around like a basket, just a, all around this, these three openings. Here's the urethra. This is the one opening I talked about. This is the birth canal, the vagina, and this is the rectum. <clears throat> and you can see that the easiest thing to leak out of here, well, we're not gonna, we're not, we're only pregnant two or three times in our life, so nothing, doesn't matter if this gets all stretched out, there's nothing's gonna come through here. And it's very hard for stool, because of uh, its bulky nature, to pop through. But boy, isn't it easy for urine to just leak right on there because it's liquid. So that's why we leak. These muscles are now weakened. So the urethra is the, is the tube in which the bladder is passed out of the body right there. And that's really wrapped with those pelvic floor muscles. When the pelvic floor muscles are strong, the urethra is supported and the leakage doesn't occur. So with the anatomical, when, when, when the pelvic um, floor muscles are weak, 
the urethra is no longer supported, allowing the urine to just sort of spill, spill out because normally those muscles grab and they tighten. What happens with, just to, while we got this diagram up, with urgency incontinence, you can have these all intact muscles down here, but what happens with urgency incontinence, the bladder has become, it's either so full or there's such irritation from coffee or caffeine that a contraction, these muscles squeeze in the, in the force or the pressure in here is greater than the pressure or the resistance band here. And so that's why people leak with urgency incontinence. Because if so, what happens with treatments for urgency incontinence is medications are directed to decrease the force of these contractions. Okay, so they weaken bladder contractions. That's what all these, you're, you're bombarded with those uh, advertisements on TV uh, for bladder control. <clears throat> So that's why there's really no good surgical pr procedure here is because the force of a bladder contraction is greater than the, all this muscular strength. That's what happens with urgency incontinence. Whereas with stress incontinence, there's no contraction. It's just that these muscles here don't tighten anymore. So you've lost the support. So, okay, so basically we we'll talk about some, uh, in general, uh, uh, surgical, one of the surgical treatments um, is a sling. Um, these are small incisions that are made into the vagina. Um, they're very small. The abdomen, um, uh, the abdomen, and, and there's little tiny incisions, two up on top, and then one in the vagina, and, the, and there's this, this, this mesh and it's inserted through the incision and placed under the urethra to like almost give it a backboard, a cradle of support. The soft mesh sling and they're made of these, it's basically suture material, suture that you would use to tie you up and, they, and, they, and they're, they're woven into a mesh-like frame and they're very inert and they don't react and they don't naturally uh, attach bacteria to them so they rarely get, they, these rarely get infected. Um, <clears throat> the mesh um, because it's got sort of fenestrations in the mesh, the tissue actually grows into it and it fixes it, the, the uh, mesh in place. So basically you put this, this piece of mesh in, it's about this wide, the strip is this uh, not very wide and it's only this long, and it loops under your, your, your urethra. Um, if uh, I can go back to that picture on the urethra, it, um, and, it, and it wraps right around here, I'll show you a picture of that right around here and it supports it. So remember I said that we try to keep the bladder in its position? Well, this is what it will do. Um, um, once the procedure is complete, the, sl the sling functions like a hammock on which your urethra rests to prevent accident leakage of urine. So there's what it looks like. Okay, up here is your bladder and it's, it's this is, it, these are meshes there, they have little, uh, uh, it's like a knitting almost, it's uh, all, the, all the suture is, is woven in such a way that tissue can grow into it and it keeps it fixed there. Back in the old days, we used to try to fix this to a point on the, these bones here and that, that never worked. So they, they, re they redeveloped it so that um, tissue can grow into it. That's why when uh, we one of the instructions post-operatively is to not to do any heavy lifting or sexual relations because it can push this out of the way before it's fully fixed in place. So the mess has been used to treat incontinence about 1968 and people have used it millions worldwide um, and basically for the first four to six weeks people should abstain from any heavy lifting exercise and intercourse for at least these, this month, so, and, but they can return to driving and other activities um, at the physician's discretion. So you can almost, I have my patients drive a car within a week um, and this, uh, and then the procedure basically is, is covered by most of the insurance plans, at least at this point. Okay, so these are the different products. I don't think that's, uh, but so the success rate. Um, basically, I think when you talk about um, uh, this, uh, um, it really depends on your, studies show that most patients are continent following these procedures and can resume 
normal and non-strenuous activities returning to work. So basically, this, they're about 70, 85. So what I, what I, when I talk about, for me, what success means is that you don't have to buy any more pads. Okay, that's, uh, they're very expensive, as everybody here knows. Uh, they, uh, um, and, and so that's really how I define it. If I, if I have a lady who still has to wear a pad, um, then I don't think it's been successful. My biggest problem is after I've examined them and I've tried to reproduce their incontinence and can't, um, and they still want to wear a pad, then I haven't done a good job because their mindset is that they've been so embarrassed for so long, it's hard for them to give up that sort of almost a security blanket of the pad after they've had a procedure. Now, one of the things that, um, that has really, you'll see, and you'll see advertisements that if you've had the sling or um, some other mesh work that you should, you know, contact your lawyer uh, because they have, um, these came under some fire from the FDA because uh, there are meshes that have been used for pelvic organ prolapse. That's when, these are called cystoceles or rectoceles. This is where your organs begin to fall out through your vagina, such as your bladder flips down into your vagina because in the vagina, um, if you look at the vagina as a canal, and on top, the roof is where your bladder sits, and on the bottom is where the floor is, and that's where the rectum is, right under there. And when those vaginal wall um, muscles are weakened, you can see everything collapses. The roof collapses, the floor gives away, and you start to begin to push your bladder through your vagina in your um, your rectum starts, that's pelvic organ prolapse. And there were meshes that were designed to prevent that from happening. Back in the old days, they used to do more formal surgery where you went in and you, you, um, you, 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 you tighten, you can't, you, where you would tighten the muscles to that, to the vaginal walls, which would bring in the muscles together. And people came up with this mesh incorporation, but these, um, these were problematic for a lot of women because they would begin to erode into the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the mesh would be exposed. Um, um, you know, normally the, we, once you put these things in, you've got to recover it with the, the uh, skin of the, uh, or the lining, I should say, but these things were eroding and creating havoc, and so the FDA took a lot of those meshes that they use for pelvic organ prolapse off the market. However, the slings that we talked about, which are much smaller pieces of uh, foreign body material that we put in, um, were not as well, they, they weren't uh, taken off the market and still, we put those in, but we do have to warn patients that they can possibly erode into the bladder and that they can, um, um, erode through the vaginal um, epithelium or lining. So, but fortunately they don't happen as much in, with slings uh, as opposed to the meshes, the big broad meshes that are used for pelvic organ prolapse. So it's been a matter of controversy and women have become quite afraid of, of um, um, going through these procedures these days because of some of those uh, um, 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 warnings from the FDA to be very careful, and you should be. You should ask the doctor, well, what's the chance that this is going to erode? And, um, and so you need to have someone with some experience who knows how to do these things because one of the problems we have with our slings is that if we put them in and, and we put them in with too much tension or we pull up too much, guess what happens? You can't urinate. So you've gone from a situation where I went all the time, now I can't even urinate. So that's not good either. So it does take some, um, it does take some experience uh, to know how to put those things in and put them in a way that, uh, that will treat the incontinence for you but uh, not restrict you either. So that's, um, <clears throat> that's basically the, uh, uh, and, and there's multiple approaches to how you put in a, sling, the concept is to keep the bladder in its position, in its normal anatomical location, 
um, so that when you bend over, cough, or sneeze, um, you, you, uh, you don't leak. Um, this type of condition, again, stress incontinence is not uh, corrected by dietary maneuvers. This is all a mechanical thing. So whereas urge incontinence, we talked about the urge, where dietary modification is quite important. You know, you, know um, you shouldn't be taking all those dietary irritants I suggested. There are medications for that. So when a patient has, um, uh, we talked about the mixed incontinence, when a patient has both stress and urgency incontinence, if the, if, if, the, if the stress incontinence component is mild, then we probably will treat with dietary modification and medications um, and bladder retraining. If the stress incontinence predominates, then we, 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 we offer either Kegels or a surgical repair uh, or fixation of the bladder. Um, and then if the urgency incontinence hasn't gone away, I inform women that they may need medication to take for the urgency incontinence. So I, I don't, you know, you just, when you go into surgery, you say, well, in a, in a case where there's mixed incontinence, um, you, you, if anybody says, well, we're gonna fix you, you're never gonna have to worry about it, you still may be wet, but, um, and you still may need some, uh, um, uh, medication, medical therapy for that. And it really depends on, you know, what really predominates. So, yes? How old can you not be baby? You still have an age limit? Oh gosh, I've done 85 year old ladies for this procedure, yeah. But how old? Most people have to be much younger. What's that? Isn't most people have to be much younger to have this procedure? No, no, that's a, this, these are all outpatient procedures. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. The question was, thank you. Uh, the, the question was, how old do you have to be to have these procedures? There is no age limit. No, there is no age limit. No, there's no age limit. Um, we tend to find that um, in people who are in their 70s and 80s, most of them, I will say, as a general rule of thumb, most ladies um, usually have urgency incontinence uh, because their, their bladder doesn't hold as much of a capacity anymore. It doesn't have the elasticity anymore, so it tends to squeeze. And basically, the, the, um, neurologically, you know, the, the, the you begin to lose some of that inhibition from uh, uh, the central nervous system down. Um, and we tend to see more stress incontinence in ladies who are done having children. Um, they are, um, um, they're in their 40s and 50s, 60s. But I've had, you know, several women in the 70s who've had this procedure. Yes? I had it last year. Mm -hmm. You probably don't remember me. You would. I can't say that if I do or don't. I'm not but supposed to say anything. The lady that brought the article in about the mesh. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, she was shaking it. And she, to talk, to talk. Yep. <laughs> and she came in and about that same time. Yep. I had to. Re, I tried to reassure my patients that, you know, for for the for the uh, sling procedure, um, it really we haven't had as bad of outcomes as they have had for the meshes um, that go in for pelvic organ prolapse. Yes. Um, so you're basically talking about that 15% failure rate. So, okay, so the question is, um, can this procedure be done a second time? Um, and so I think the, uh, you're referring to the 15% failure rate. Um, now you have to make sure that it, you know, you're not dealing with, you're dealing with uh, failure due to stress incontinence and not refractory urgency incontinence. Um, it can be done a second time. I have actually done one a second time. I have a, a young lady who's a softball player and she's squatting and 
crying and she heard, she slid in the home plate, she told me she heard something snap. So I looked and looked in, I couldn't find any erosions of the tape. Uh, um, and I repeated the procedure and she did well, uh, but it can be done again. It's a little challenging, but it can be done again. Yes? Dr. Jones, what, is there any increase in um, something like the urinary tract infection after having that done? Because it does restrict somewhat. No, because you should still be able to empty completely. Now, if, if, if you've put the sling in too tight and, and the physician will, should know that because you, you should be seen in a week after the operation. And what I do is I always check a bladder ultrasound in my office. I have a lady urinate and then I scan her with my ultrasound to see how much she's retained. Um, and if, um, you know, if, if you're retaining, you need to really go back in there. You can go back in, in, in through the vaginal incision and to loosen that tape up a little bit. Um, so uh, that, that you only get those conditions. See, the sling, I've, I really haven't ever experienced a, uh, um, a um, infection from this, this, this mesh because it's, it's like we use this just for regular suture material when we, when we did old fashioned operations back in the old days, we, we'd use proline and this is what this is. And, and it's really, the reason why we use that suture is because it doesn't. I wasn't thinking in terms of the material or the procedure right. telling you, but of the restriction of the urethra. Well, the restriction in the re urethra would then lead to chronic re urinary retention. And if you chronically retain urine, especially if you're a lady, um, you're going to get infections. There's a whole, we could do a whole lecture. Uh, we should do a female <coughs> series because on, like with urinary tract infections, the side point is that all our, all infections come from rectal organisms. No matter how clean you are in that area, the distance between your rectum and your urethra is very close. And when you go through a change of life and you lose estrogen and everything shrinks, that distance becomes even closer. So that postmenopausal females are at more risk of urinary tract infections in general. And you lose part of the aging process and being men in menopause is you lose your estrogen. And estrogen is very acidic and it retards the bacteria from getting into your bladder, into your, escaping into your bladder, your urethra, the urethra. Um, and so basically, uh, normally, if you check the pH of the vaginal area, it's very low. And that's not a good bacteria don't survive well in, in, in acidic environments. And so that's how, um, and this is why w older women uh, who've gone through change of life who are not on any estrogen replacement are more at risk for urinary tract infection. So that's a side, I, I know it's not having to do with any incontinence, that's just for our knowledge base. So. Yes? Would you use, um, with a prolapsed, um and stress incontinence, you still can use the sling procedure? Oftentimes, um, uh, the question is, if you have a prolapse and you, um, of your organs, uh, pelvic organ prolapse, um, and you also have stress incontinence, can you use a mesh and can you use a, a sling? Um, yes, you can. Um, and that's actually quite common. Um, um, to do both procedures at the same time. Um, I think the trend has gotten away from, for the pelvic organ prolapse, people are going back to the sort of laparoscopically or robotically assisted resuspension of everything, um, um, and then at the same time putting in a sling. So that can be done at the same time. It's actually um, quite common. And, and for that, a pa patient may even stay overnight. All these patients are normally, all these uh, procedures, I should say, are normally done as outpatients. No, it's rare to come into the hospital. 
The only reason why we admit somebody if they've had uh, overnight for observation, sometimes if they've had a reaction to anesthesia and they're nauseated, or if they can't urinate right away. Um, and a lot of times, uh, if you can't urinate right away, it's not because the sling is too tight, it's because when I do these procedures, one of the things that I do is I infiltrate that whole area around your bladder and all those muscles with a lot of local anesthetics such as Novocaine or Xylocaine. And that's so that when you get up, you don't feel it. There's very little discomfort for at least four or five hours following that procedure. Uh, but sometimes that affects your bladder from functioning and contracting too. But, uh, but again, these are, are usually all done as outpatients. Yes? Does incontinence have anything to do with losing bowel movement? They can basically, um, the you know, the question is, does incontinence have anything to do with, you know, can you get fecal incontinence? Um, you have an accident right. Yes, because basically uh, um, it has to, some of that has to do with the uh, uh, pelvic floor. Uh, some of it has to do with uh, people. We haven't even said anything about people who have neurological conditions because they have bigger problems. Dementia, or people who are demented have an issue with both fecal incontinence. It can go together, yes. Well, Certainly if you have diabetes and, and you really um, have a neuropathy associated with that, you can have fecal incontinence plus uh, um, stress in, in plus in, in urinary incontinence. Can that be corrected? If you have a, a, a bad medical condition, such as uh, a neurological condition, probably not um, corrected I'm not well. Talking about my sister, not me. Okay. She also, um, your sister, uh, she has a sister that's 91 years old and who basically is incontinent of urine in stool. She had two uh, surgeries way back 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. can, she, can she ambulate? Because one of the biggest things here with um, incontinence is you have to take a history because one of the biggest reasons why people leak is because they can't get to the bathroom because they're not mobile enough. <clears throat> you imagine how bad that is if you're in a nursing home and you require two people to get you out of your bed and chair. You know you've got to go. You're mentally, you're, your mental capacity is there. You get an urge to go, but there's nobody around. You can't move, even with a bedside commode. That's one of the biggest problems that we face, uh, you know, with, in the nursing home population, or even people at home, people with bad arthritis. They can't, they can't move. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> well, good. So she's mobile, and she and she's still leaking. Then we have to find out whether it's due to stress or urgency incontinence. Well, we have to find out what that's due to because you got you got to take a lot of stuff into history. You got to check on her, her diet. You got to check on what else is she on for medications that may be affecting that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there are certain medications. Is she emptying her bladder? One of the biggest. We didn't get into how we work patients up, but the first thing I do when I evaluate a a person for incontinence is. Do they empty their bladder to completion? That's really key because if you don't empty your bladder, even bending over, you can leak because you just water over a dam. That's called overflow incontinence, which we haven't even talked about here. Diabetics with neuropathy uh, leak their urine. Okay, they have they have pelvic floor weakness. Um, the, the 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 nerves that go into tightening the pelvic floor muscles don't tighten as well, they don't work as well. And so you can't tighten your muscles even if they're in great shape. So neuropathy, is so there's a lot of reasons why 
Okay, it's, it's, it's not really straightforward unless you do a good history, you gotta do a good exam. And usually you can come to the problem. The more complicated cases are, are people with neurological conditions, such as multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, myasthenia gravis. Um, those are a little bit more challenging and a little bit more difficult to treat. Yes? Many times when you watch television and you see all these medical ads, which seem to be, you are inundated with, when they show the ones that have to do with urinary incontinence, they often will say, if you have eye problems or a glaucoma suspect or anything like that, to be very aware. What is in those medications that would have any effect on that? So the condition is usually narrow angle glaucoma. And so some of the, the anticholinergic medications that we use Vesicare, Ditropan, um, Toviaz, uh, Enablex, and there's, uh, all make that condition worse of their, because of their chemical makeup. One of the problems with the medications that we use for urgency incontinence is that they, one of the reasons why people don't stay on them is because they create a great deal of dry mouth constipation, people with glaucoma, narrow angle glaucoma, makes it worse. Um, and if in the summertime they prevent you from perspiring, that's another thing you have to worry about. People, these also, the other problems with these medications that you don't, they don't tell you about is that they, if you have a neurological condition, it makes it worse. Um, and so those are major issues that we have with those kind of medications. Um, is all those for all those reasons? Like constipation, dry mouth. It's it's awful. Um, and you know when you get con just think when you get constipated, guess what's in front of the rectum? It's your bladder. Okay, and uh, it makes it very difficult. It makes your incont urinary incontinence sometimes worse. But they sometimes do help. But I'm just saying that they do have. A lot of side effects, and you know, most of the people we treat in the 70s, 80s, 90s, um, they have other medications that you have to be wary of. Um, when you're treating people like that, they, um, um, and, and so you have to use these medications with great caution um, in people who are older. So, I mean, if you listen to, I think, the ad log enough, you'll get a lot of disclaimers about the dry mouth and everything like that. One of the things that I should mention as part of the talk is that there's a, what happens with people who have bad urgency incontinence and, and medications are either create too many side effects or too expensive, if one of those conditions, and what do we do? I mean, is there any hope for people with straightforward urgency incontinence who are mobile, who, are, who don't have anything else but straight, you know, who are, are still just can't, they just go all the time, they're totally embarrassed. A very active people, uh, they can't store their urine anymore. There's a whole area of what we call, um, you know, we talked about, we, we often will send people to physical therapists to sort of retrain their bladder muscles, but is neuromodulation. That's a whole new area that we've, er, we, we, we treat, and these are, for refractory cases of uh, urgency incontinence. Um, we've actually used it for men with urinary retention, but for the, for the purposes of this talk, is that what we do is we, um, we try to re-stimulate the nerves that go to the bladder. Um, Interstim is a therapy that we use where we actually put a, it almost looks like um, if anybody's ever had a, a heart pacer, you'll see that there is a, a, a wire that goes into your heart that paces it, okay? Well, we do the same thing to the, the S3 nerve root in the back. We put a little wire and we attach this lead to a stimulator, which pulses the nerve all the time and it kind of almost like reawakens the nerve so that, you know, it, it begins to function again. And if, you know, we, 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 we allow patients to they wear this little, like what I got here, um, on the side, and they, they, um, 
they, they turn up the frequency and we find out, we take their history and, um, um, and if they've been more than 50% successful at getting, obtaining dryness, we will then put a smaller permanent, almost look, just looks just like a cardiac pacer into, the, into just above their butt here in the back, in their buttocks. Um, and, and we use that, that, that is a treatment um, for refractory cases. Um, we also have a treatment that's not as invasive. Um, we use um, pre-tibial nerve stimulation where we actually use the, we have an, acupu we have an acupuncture-like uh, wire. We attach it to the nerve that goes just behind your ankle. Uh, women come in for 12 sessions over 12 weeks, you know, for 10 minutes, and we, we, we stimulate that nerve, um, and um, that's a little easier because that doesn't involve uh, an anesthetic. So the interstim that I just talked about where we stimulate the nerve root, you have to go in and, and we, and we, um, we have to have a general anesthesia. That's a hospital-based procedure even though it's an outpatient procedure. Um, and we, um, um, and then, and then to go back in uh, if we have to put, if it works, we have to have a second procedure there to put the permanent battery in. Um, and so they're all, they're not very lengthy procedures, but they still involve hospitalization, whereas the, the, um, the, the tibial nerve stimulation um, is just basically office-based. The lady comes in my office and we, we know where your nerve is. We put this little acupuncture needle into the nerve and, and hook it to a, uh, um, uh, uh, a generator and we stimulate the nerve. And so that's what we do for cases that are refractory to medications. And it doesn't hurt, uh, you know, people bring something to read for 15 minutes, so. Yes? Um, I had a cyst to slow down seven years ago, mm -hmm. and um, I've been having a pain in my side. Could it be related to something happening with the cyst seal breaking down? Okay. So the question is, uh, a cyst seal repair done several years ago, and there's now a pain in the side. Right in here. Uh -huh. Your right side. Well, first of all, you have to know um, how many years ago was your cystic seal repaired and how was it repaired? 2004, maybe. And did they do it the traditional way without any meshes? Well, you'd have to be re examined and assessed. Most of the time with pelvic organ prolapse, what ladies complain about is, first of all, they if it's a bladder drop called a cystocele, uh, sometimes people will say, geez, I feel some pressure in between my legs. It almost feels like there's a grapefruit in there, and I don't understand why, and then they don't, and they don't, I'm not urinating very well. Well, guess what? Most of the urine is in that bladder, which is now coming out through their vagina. That's the more typical complaint for a rectocele, which is the, you know, where the rectum comes up into the vagina, the most common complaint there from a lady is more constipation. Um, but a pain in the side uh, in an area where the, the, there was no meshes used, I don't know what that is. You'd have to be examined. The first thing that's got to be done is you have to have a pelvic exam to see if it's recurred. Thank you. Yes? I don't know if anybody else has experienced this, but I'm very active. I'm 79. I'm fine when I'm out shopping. When I come up from Paula to Rutland and I'm going around all day, I might stop at the restroom a couple of times in the day at home, whether I'm sitting around or whether I'm working in the barn or whatever. Boy, it seems like about every hour I better find a bathroom. And I don't know why. Um, I don't know if it's. What could that be connected with? Why am I. Okay, when I'm shopping and rubbing. <laughs> so so we're, we're, we're a very active person who, when at home, they tend to go more frequently. Um, and when they have errands to do, um, they don't go as much. And why is that? Not as 
thinking about it? Um, that's hard to say. Um, I can't answer that one specifically. It really depends. I'd have to take a little bit more history. When you're home, do you drink more fluid? Do you uh, do you do? Um, um, And I thought maybe it has something to do with tension, or I don't know. And I don't know if that is something that other people experience or not. I think a lot of people have said that to me. They, you know, they, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. They probably they might be thinking about urination more when they're when they're one of the one of the problems that I, the more thing that I. Um, uh, people will tell me that they go more frequently at home, but and then the, they're not incontinent. But what I usually say is, well, geez, you know, I'm I'm fine. The minute I get home, I'm you get in the door and I'm starting to leak already. Well, one of the problems is is that people don't like to urinate in strange places, um, and they probably put off suppress the urge to go more frequently, and so they tend to get because they've been traveling all around or doing errands. They they, they tend to. Uh, retain your urine and they're more likely to remember when your bladder hits a certain point it's going to squeeze and, and, and no matter how tight your pelvic floor muscles are you're going to leak. But you know straight up I'd have to ask a few more questions regarding that. that that's a hard one to answer. Five cups of coffee, three cans of Diet Coke, um, then your body is telling you that you got to go because what's happening is your bladder has hit the point. And so what will happen um, is that one of these days, you're gonna stop getting signals from your bladder, from your brain down, or you're gonna, you're gonna, root, you're gonna destroy the, the sensory mechanism. And so you're gonna get one of these big floppy bladders that said, geez, when I was a kid, Geez, I always had the urge to go, but now I never go. Well, you never go because you've got this huge bladder that doesn't respond anymore. <laughs> you've overstretched it over all the years, and when you overstretch a muscle, you kill it, okay? You really, it really, when you overstretch a muscle, um, you will pay the price for that. One of the most common things I hear from men is that Geez, you know, in the morning, I, I go about three or four times during the morning. Um, well, what's happened is when people go to bed at night, and you think if you get six or eight hours of sleep, and you don't go to the bathroom, guess what happens? You stretch your muscle. So basically, your muscle, a stretched out muscle, doesn't function until it gets its size back, okay? So that's why, you, you, during the daytime, you would never go eight hours without urinating, would you? So you, when you have oh yeah, bladder. because basically that you'll pay the price for that, and you'll end up with a big floppy bladder that doesn't work anymore, which you might be prone to infections in the future, because of retained urine and all those factors that go into developing a urinary tract infection for women that I, I said earlier, lack of estrogen, you know, proximity of the uh, urethra to the rectum. Yes. Does it matter whether you drink? Uh, regular coffee or decaf? Does it matter whether you drink regular coffee or decaf? Coffee or decaf. Uh, well, caffeine, caffeine um, will definitely make you go. I mean, I think it's, re yeah. remember, you gotta remember it's volume, but then if, um, if you're drinking something that's gonna a direct bladder irritant, remember, you know, most of the time we all go to the bathroom because the pressure sensors in our bladder tell us we've hit the stretch point. Whereas when you start to drink irritation, they will just add, automatically squeeze your bladder. Whether it's full or not, you've got to go. So, and, and alcohol, uh, that works by a different mechanism. Normally our bodies work to conserve water. And there's a, a hormone that we have that's put out by our bodies to conserve water. It's called antidiuretic hormone. And it works at the level of the kidney. When you drink alcohol, what happens is you suppress that hormone. So basically you end up urinating larger volumes. People say, well, I just drank too much. No, you're not reabsorbing the water. 
And that's why people who may drink too much might feel dehydrated in the morning because they've lost a lot of free water that they should have been reabsorbing because they suppress their antidiuretic hormone. So that's why people go more frequently alcohol. Alcohol is not necessarily a direct irritant, but it, it works on, on a hormonal basis to create a large urine volume. So there's other things that make you go more frequently. Uh, I mean, it's all about, there's so many things we could talk about, like if you're a diabetic and you're not in good control, guess what? You're going to urinate all day long and you'll leak. Um, because what happens with people with diabetes, if they're not in good control, their body starts spilling sugar in their urine. And the sugar is like removes high sugar levels in your blood will often remove water from your cells and you may um, uh, go very frequently. So, you know, that's another reason why people leak is because their sugar is not necessarily under control. So there's so, so many things that can cause urinary incontinence. I mean, I know we talked about stress and it has nothing to do, that's just purely a mechanical thing for the most part, but there's so many causes of why people leak their urine. Yes. So why do some people pee right out and other people can't go? They just go slow. Question is why do people for go slow and why do sometimes they <coughs> squirt right out? Well, the squirting right out is a very fast bladder contraction, very strong bladder contraction. Good. Well, it's embarrassing. <laughs> You're getting it out, but it's you don't want to be in a place where your bladder's overactive, okay? Because, you know, what happens is in time is that you begin, begin to lose some of those fibers, the elastic fibers that allow you to accommodate urine. Okay, it's, it's a very unique type of muscle. You can accommodate, you can stretch it out. Uh, but in time, if, you've, if you've, you know, don't pay attention to your signals, um, the bladder muscle starts to change and it doesn't expand like it used to. And, and why are you going, why don't you go slow then? A slow muscle may be a weak, mu uh, a, a slow urination, what causes slow urination? Well, if it's not a mechanical stricture, which it rarely is, um, um, a slow may be because your bladder muscle is weak. Okay, you've lost your tone and you don't empty to completion. So still well, actually, um, it depends on how you're referring. Now, you, uh, a, a muscle that really squeezes um, is going to create, cause urinary leakage most of the time, whereas a bladder muscle that's weak from like somebody with a neuropathy from diabetes is going to contract and you're going to retain. You won't empty to completion. You not you won't be incontinent, but you'll be more set up for potential for urinary tract infections. So we're talking about, you know, don't get confused. When your bladder is overactive, you're more likely to be incontinent and not have the control. Whereas if your bladder muscle is too weak and not strong enough, you're more likely to retain urine. Huh? And then pee slow. And pee slow and not empty. Remember, you, you need to store and you need to empty completion. Okay, so, you know, I, we, 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 I know the talk is incontinence, but retaining urine is not good either. Because what can retention do? Well, if you retain your urine, there, is a, there can be a pressure back up on your kidneys, and your kidneys don't drain well. And that, when your kidneys don't drain well, then that affects, you know, people can get uremia. Okay, and uremia is an old-fashioned condition that men used to have in the 30s before there was good, effective treatments for their prostate. Uremia is where you get all your toxins built up in your system. Okay, and it creates confusion, that sort of thing. So, I think emptying the bladder to completion, um, is more, it's just as important as 
treating in urinary incontinence from an overactive bladder. What's that? That's great. You, you may have a weak bladder, and some people can get away with that. Some, some ladies I, I have and some men who don't empty their bladder to completion, they don't have any infections, they don't have any leakage. You know, sometimes leakage comes with, remember that condition I said overflow incontinence? It's water over the dam. You squeeze only enough to get the, keep you out of trouble, keep your, you know, keep the pressure off your bladder. So, but if you had urinary tract infections one after another, we might want to recommend a scheme for where you might catheterize yourself three or four times a day to empty yourself. Mm. So, yes. If, you, if your problem is mostly uh, your activities like uh, bowling, golf, um, coughing, sneezing, and things like that, or lifting something heavy, um, is there something you can just you know, kind of do about that, or is that just going to <laughs> So the problem is, uh, the question was, if your problem is mostly with coughing, laughing, sneezing, or lifting something heavy, what can you do about that? Well, we, the treatments include um, bladder floor, uh, bladder muscle retraining, Kegel exercises. You want to tighten that muscle, because remember, that's a support issue. Remember, the muscles are not grabbing the urethra tight, they're not squeezing, and they do it automatically for you. You know, the, the tone of your muscle will change depending on your position, but if that mechanism doesn't work anymore, then you need to, you could do that yourself by retraining those muscles uh, with pelvic floor muscle retraining, Kegel exercises. Um, usually I recommend people squeezing that muscle for about 10 seconds and uh, keep it and do it several times a day. Yeah, if, you, if, you, if, you, if your problem is purely stress incontinence, that's the, that's the frontline treatment is not surgery. Mm -hmm. It's to, you know, re-strengthen those pelvic floor muscles. I stubbed my toe going upstairs. Right. And that, that caused right. leaking. Le le right. Funny things like that. And some of the more sophisticated treatments of physical therapists, they'll, they'll put things into the vagina and ask you to squeeze on those things to sort of, sort of, you can re-know, you can retrain yourself where those muscles are because sometimes people forget that they have those muscles there. And, you know, and people, you know, they haven't been caught in embarrassing situations where they've had to squeeze their muscles. So sometimes, you know, that's what physical therapists can do is they'll, they'll help you retrain those muscles. Questions? Sure. Yeah. But the cost of you know incontinence is a, just it's a, um, boy those pads are so expensive. I hate to see that. That just uh, it kills me. Yes, sir. What's that? Uh, The question was the, the, the material that's used for those slings. Yes. Oh, oh, you were saying about the tightening around the so it doesn't leak. Reduce the leakage. Is that material, is that elastic material that you use? Or around the urethra, the, those are slings. Okay. But is, is it from elastic itself? It gives a little bit, yeah. I mean, there is some give to that. Yeah, I mean, um, they will actually tighten up a little bit once you put them in the body a little bit, so that's why we don't want to put them in too tight. They almost look loose when we put them in. And you almost say, geez, that doesn't, that's not going to do anything, but when you position yourself, they'll stretch a little bit, but, but once they've fixed in, once the tissue grows inside those penetrations that are in the mesh, then it's fixed. That's fixed. There is another, um, Um, medi uh, sort of a, a thing that we didn't really talk about, wasn't mentioned here. We have agents called urethral bulking agents. 
Okay, they are materials that are, they look like a paste. And um, for people who don't want to go through a formal procedure, um, these, this is a material that we use. Um, I, uh, we, we put it inside the urethra near the bladder neck. Let me see if I can go through. Um, okay, so right about here, this area I'm talking about right here, you see how this is? Well, right in here, we can look in with a scope and we will in infiltrate this area with the material that stays there. Uh, we used to, the original product we used to use was contagen. That was purified cow skin. But that was very, you know, would work. And what it acts is it, it acts to create passive resistance in this area, okay? Because remember, all the sling is doing really, it's kind of fixing the area and it's creating a passive resistance there, okay? So if you can bulk up this area without putting the patient into retention, then you can get by without uh, a formal um, operation. I mean, a, a good case in point is not only for people who don't want to have um, a formal procedure like this. I had a young lady, she was about 35 years old. She hadn't decided whether she was going to um, have, uh, if she was done having children but her leakage was so embarrassing to her that she couldn't do anything that uh, she wanted to have something done. We, we tend not to, um, um, excuse me, we tend not to do this procedure um, on ladies who um, have not completed having children yet because you, one of the things is with, uh, with labor and, and, and vaginal deliveries, that could rip out with co contractions. So we'd not like to put something as permanent as this in until a woman has said, okay, I am, I'm definitely done having my family. I'm not gonna have any more kids. But for short term, we can use these bulking agents. Um, and we use contagen, it was not a bad material, but the problem is it was biodegradable, the bio body would eat it up. But now we have more inert materials that we use. Uh, the latest one is called macroplastique, and it stays there, and it, and it, and it creates a, a, a bulk. It provides resistance so that the urine can't come through here uh, passively, you know, with just a little pressure. I mean, when your bladder squeezes, it's gonna open up. But for just passive resistance, um, it, will, it will keep a, a lady dry. So that's another treatment option for stress incontinence, a urethral bulking agent. So medications, bulking agents, surgery, yes? How complex is that procedure as compared to the, the mesh or the sling? How complex is the placing a urethral bulking material as compared to a formal procedure like a sling? Well. There's certainly really no chance of any um, sort of risky issues. Um, you know, there's no bleeding. Um, it's done through a scope. We don't use any inf incisions, so there's no chance of a wound infection. Um, it's very straightforward. Um, it takes probably about five minutes to do. Done as an outpatient. I think, you know, one of the things is you could do this as an outpatient in your office clinic. But you know, it's nice to have, we don't, you know, it's, sometimes the problem is if we use a local anesthetic in the area, it kind of distorts the anatomy. Um, we, we, and we want to have the perfect position we, because we're, we're, we're looking through a scope and we have to use a needle to direct it under the lining, the, the lining of the urethra um, and so if you do it in the office, the tendency for a lady to move, I would move, I would, you'd have to pull, peel me off the ceiling. I'd be so anxious. So I would not be a candidate. Um, I actually have a, a, a young lady who uh, has a whole bunch of sort of mobility issues and 
she can't empty her bladder and she has some contractions. She gets around in her wheelchair and um, <clears throat> in order for her to drain her bladder, instead of leaving a regular catheter, we put a catheter in through over her pubic bone. It's called a suprapubic catheter. But she was still having leakage. I mean, it wasn't draining all her urine completely. And we, you know, and I've been seeing her for years and we'd go in and put this contagen in and she'd get a little break, but it was never quite good. But she was a lady that we just recently put the, this newer agent in and, and she's, uh, you know, I'm her new best friend. Um, and she's been dry now for three or four months. And for her, you know, just to just imagine if you can't really get down there and wipe yourself and you're wet all the time and what that does for skin breakdown. These are, these are some of the worst conditions. I know it's not cancer, but geez, to have skin breakdown and to, and to have all this irritation from urine, oh God, it's an awful thing. Uh, just, it's, it's very tough on, on people. It's, it's, gosh, I'd rather have an open sore than have you know, a rash from you know, urinary incontinence. Yes? I've got one more question about that. What is the recovery on that? This is my son. If I have a procedure like that, mm. he's going to be doing my chores. And okay. <laughs> so basically, if you have a procedure like this, we talked about, so what is the recovery time from a procedure like this? It's minimal. You're, um, we just ask that, you know, um, you don't do any heavy lifting or straining because the more you bend over and, and do this, we, do, we, we don't want to have uh, you lift uh, sitting on hard objects. Obviously, n no vaginal penetration of anything. Like for younger women uh, who are still having their menses, we, we ask them not to use tampons. Um, huh, no sexual intercourse. We ask people not to go to the gym for a while. You know, but it's usually about, like I say, about four to six weeks till that heals in where we, the, the activity can lose. But if you want to go walking, if you want to go up and down the stairs, um, that's fine. But no, you know, no heavy grocery bags, no, no, n no vacuuming, no moving, furni <laughs> no, no moving furniture. Okay. So, I mean, you still can, you can drive a car. Okay. Uh, hay bales, I wouldn't be recommended. <laughs> That's not a good one. Yeah. And, and certainly, if you're on the farm, you don't want to be bouncing on the. I, I said you could ride a car, but I didn't say you could ride a tractor. <laughs> I think her son should just play take over until she's all better. So she said her son should take over until she's yeah. better. <laughs> yeah. There's very little, you know, there's. Like the <clears throat> I think, in terms of what, you know, the big question is, you know, how much pain am I in? Well, it's not really a lot of pain when we don't, it's, uh, we, we don't do a lot of dissection. We just, we're just placing something, okay? And the incis incisions are really superficial, okay? And the, the vaginal incision is only this big. And those stitches normally fall out by themselves. And then, um, you know, sometimes um, a lot of places for the small incisions that we make up on top, the two small ones, um, <clears throat> I use stitches, some places use surgical glue. I don't like the, you know, the glue, it's nice, but it's sexy, it's fancy, but it's also very expensive. And anything we can do to cut cost, you know, is, yeah, so. Those stitches um, up, up top that we use come out in about a week. The vaginal st stitches that we use will stay longer, but they'll fall out by themselves in about three to four weeks. So ladies may see a discharge in three to four weeks small amount so more questions well okay thank you very much I have enjoyed your questions